Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three of the virtual Island Summit. It is a pleasure for me to be presenting here this session today. My name is Christian Sakino. I am the chief of staff here at Island Innovation. I am based on Margarita Island off the coast of Venezuela on the beautiful Caribbean region. And I want to let you know, uh, in case you didn't know already, that Island Innovation is a global network and a creative agency that's helping advance innovation and drive sustainable change across island communities worldwide. We build digital bridges between the world's islands, and we are very proud of this. You can visit islandinnovation.co to find out more about the work that we do. This session, and this session is super important for us, it's called International Criminal Court and International Court of Justice, powerful and practical legal tools in pursuit of climate justice. This session is sponsored by the government of Vanuatu and Stop Ecosai Foundation. Before we begin, I invite you to use the chat function to introduce yourself and let us know where you're coming from, your sector and your industry. A poll should be appearing right now on your screen so you can begin answering uh, and let us know where you are connecting from and the industry that you belong to. You can also make use of the chat to add any comments that you want on the session and feel free to introduce yourselves over there and share your social media cards. I would like to also call attention to the Q&A box that you will see on the bottom left of your Zoom app. That is where you will be able to add questions. Any questions that you may have for our participants for our panelists, you can add them there on the Q&A box and they will be addressed on the Q&A section of this session. I can see that we have a lot of participation already on the poll, so you can keep answering. And I would like to go into the topic of session. Ecocide is quite severe and either widespread or long-term harm to nature. This is a crime that could provide a legal Warp rail to steer us back from the precipice by setting an outer boundary to deter, prevent, and sanction the worst threats to ecosystems, which are a root cause of climate change. Now, we're going to cover this on this session. I would also like to inform you that we have interpretation into Spanish and French languages. You can change these languages on the world globe icon that you will see on the bottom of your Zoom app and then you can select the language you want to hear. Now we have the results of the poll, thank you. So we can see that North America and Europe are very well represented on this panel. And thank you, uh, especially to the people in Europe because I know it's, uh, it's late for you over there. And we also have a strong representation from the Caribbean and the Pacific region. So thank you all for joining. About this sector we have, the majority of people here from NGOs and from the private government and academia sectors. And as far as the industry goes, people are either on environmental services or oceans conservation and management and consulting. Thank you for your participation. I would like to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Christopher Bartlett, Climate Diplomacy Manager at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Vanuatu government. Thank you, Christopher, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for being a part of this year's Virtual Island Summit. I will now hand it over to our moderator. Christopher, you can take it away. Thank you so very much, and welcome to everybody to what I think is going to be a fantastic session on practical legal tools that are right now being pursued for climate justice. As said, uh, I am Christopher Bartlett. I am climate diplomacy manager in the government of the Republic of Vanuatu. Uh, Vanuatu is one of the world's most risk prone and vulnerable countries. And we are already experiencing devastating climate change loss and damage, which impacts not only our economy, our ecosystems, but fundamental human rights of our people. Uh, the UNFCCC climate negotiations are moving far too slowly. And the Paris Agreement's nationally determined contributions are set to take us well beyond 
the vital 1.5 degree warming limit. And that is why Vanuatu is stepping up and stepping out to consider all pathways to save this planet and the islands of the blue Pacific continent. So today's session is in essence, a high level briefing on two very distinct yet complementary avenues to addressing different aspects of global climate change and the ecological crisis using international law. So law is a lever that has been significantly underused in the climate ambition context and offers a number of potentially effective tools that merit closer examination. So we'll be looking at two of these tools today. One of the tools is the recognition of ecocide or acts threatening severe and either widespread or long-term harm to nature as a crime at the International Criminal Court, the ICC. This court deals with crimes of the most serious concern to the international community as a whole, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So recognition of ecocide among these crimes could provide a legal guardrail to steer humanity back from the precipice, uh, precipice by setting an outer boundary to deter and sanction mass damage and destruction of ecosystems, a root cause of the global climate crisis. The other avenue that we'll be looking at today is the global campaign led by Vanuatu seeking a legal advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on the obligations of states under international law to protect the rights of present and future generations from the adverse effects of climate change. Such a non-binding advisory opinion will review and clarify what existing obligations could already be applied by states to address the climate emergency. So we're here today to learn about these two specific and distinct legal avenues, ecocide at the ICC and an advisory opinion from the ICJ to clarify our legal thinking behind each and to find out how they can respectively frame the duties and responsibilities that could bridge for a livable world for the children of all species, including our own. Vanuatu, of course, is at the forefront of both of these discussions on the global stage, and we are proud to be co-hosting today's conversation along the Stop Ecocide Foundation. So speaking now specifically at the Ecocide Initiative, uh, we will be privileged to have with us the renowned international lawyer, Philippe Sanz QC and Jojo Meta, chair of the Stop Ecocide Foundation. And we will hear from them in a short while. But to start, uh, we are very pleased to have with us the Honorable Bakwa Kaltonga, who is Minister of Agriculture, Livestock, Forestry, Fisheries, and Biosecurity of the Government of Vanuatu, as well as the Special Envoy on Climate Change for the Pacific. Honorable Minister Bakwa, we are delighted to have you uh, here with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Chris. And good day to you all, and thank you for joining this event. Seven years ago, 196 parties at COP21 in Paris signed a legally binding international treaty on climate change. Countries around the world celebrated this landmark first step towards what we hope would have been and would be an accountable, transparent, and life-saving requirements to reduce the impact of global warming. We knew then that climate change is the world's single greatest threat to development, to sustainable economies, and to human rights. Pacific Island countries were the first to ratify the Pacific Climate Accords. Small countries emitting the least amount of carbon led the way and continue to do so. However, despite our efforts, we are still facing an existential crisis. Global action is inadequate. And unless there is a radical shift in ambition, we will overshoot 1.5 degrees in a few years. The UN Secretary General tells us the planet is on life support. And this is backed up by climate science, which show terrifying global impacts. Everyone across the planet is already suffering intensifying climate impacts, whether it is nations in the global north or the global south. 
whether in the highest emitting nations or the lowest. In Vanuatu, collapse of agricultural systems and availability of drinking water, death of entire coral reefs from acidification and bleaching, spread of pests and disease, including malaria and dengue fever, landslides, catastrophic cyclones, and sea level rise are just some of the impacts we face. Vanuatu is the voice of many. It is a Pacific voice, and it is a voice that is global for all small islands and across all continents. Fundamental human rights are being undermined. The right to food, the right to water, to shelter, and many more rights are being compromised. The United Nations climate process is moving too slowly. And the Paris Agreement's national determined contributions or NDCs do not match the legal obligations of states to prevent climate harm as protected by international laws and treaties on human rights, the environment, the oceans, and common law principles. Fossil fuel projects are expanding and the world's addiction to coal, oil, and gas is deepened. Science is crystal clear. We will soon breach 1.5 degrees, leading to terrifying loss and damage and ecosystem tipping points. So again, it is us, the small island states, who are taking the lead. But what is calling on the United Nations General Assembly for a resolution requesting the International Court of Justice to provide an advisory opinion on the obligations of states under the international law to protect the rights of present and future generations against the adverse effects of climate change. An advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice is not legally binding, but carries a lot of legal weight and moral authority, which will be useful as states formulate more ambitious NDCs to the Paris Agreement and strengthen their domestic laws and policy. Vanuatu is not alone. And to be very clear, this is not a court case. We are not blaming or targeting any particular nation. There will be no winners, nor will be any losers. This is an initiative of the world's most vulnerable nations. And we are very grateful for the support we have received since this campaign started in the classrooms of our young people, concerned about the future if climate change is not stopped. Major blocks globally, including the Caribbean leaders of CARICOM and the ministers of the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, OACPS, and the Pacific Island Forum leaders have already endorsed the ICJ pathway. But we are asking all member states to endorse the ICJ pathway and vote for our resolution to bring climate change to the International Court of Justice through the UN General Assembly. And we will all benefit, every citizen across the globe. At ICJ, advisory opinions provide legal clarification on critical global issues, and have recently addressed sensitive issues like denuclearization, colonialism, and self-determination. The ICJ initiative is an example of a constructive and non-contentious kind of transformative approach global leaders are falling for. All credible pathways to address the climate emergency should be pursued, and we feel the ICJ is our best chance for change. Simply, we require legal clarity on the world's biggest problem, 
from the world's highest court. All principal organs of the United Nations have been given the opportunity to provide guidance on climate change, with the exception of the UN's International Court of Justice. We all need to better understand how existing international laws can be applied to strengthen action on climate change and to protect people and the environment. So what are we asking the UN for? The current draft UNGA resolution centers on human rights, environmental protection, and intergenerational equity, and does not contain any references to sensitive issues like compensation, reparations, or loss and damages. The International Court of Justice would be asked for its clarifying opinion on what is already contained within existing international law and not make any new laws or require new obligations. Of course, the resolution will undergo a process of consultation commencing mid-October through December before the UNJ vote. We are confident the highest court is also ready to address climate change to engage in science and look holistically across international laws to provide constructive legal clarity. Young people and civil society organizations are calling on UN member states to support this resolution and the world is closely watching the outcome. While Vanuatu is proud to take the lead on this initiative, we would be honored to have your endorsement and any influence you can wield to ensure all UN members and all UN member states vote in favor of this resolution at the President 77th session of the UNJ. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Vanuatu, like most states, believes climate change must be addressed now. Seven years is already too long for, to wait for action. It is the biggest risk to our children and their children. And we are asking for your support. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you too much. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister for setting this very sobering scene of the climate crisis facing Vanuatu and the Pacific, and also your very clear outline of Vanuatu's International Court of Justice initiative on human rights, environmental protection, and intergenerational equity. Now, as you said, supported by more than 80 nations around the world to be voted on at the current session of the UN General Assembly. And so now to give us additional background, on the legal premises behind the ICJ initiative, we are delighted to have with us here, Autumn Bordner of Blue Ocean Law. Mrs. Bordner is an associate attorney at Blue Ocean Law with a focus on climate change law, human rights law, and decolonialization. She is the founder of Allies for Micronesia Project, a nonprofit working to address the justice challenges facing peoples in US insular areas. And she's also engaged at the University of Melbourne on how colonial legacies of modern legal systems affect justice in climate adaptation. She was previously an Ocean Law Fellow at UC Berkeley Law School of Law and a lecturer in international relations at Stanford University. Ms. Bordner, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Christopher, and um, thank you to Island Innovation for hosting this important event. Um, as Christopher mentioned, I will be providing a little bit more um, background regarding the legal thinking around the ICJAO initiative. So I'll start off talking a little bit more about what the ICJ is and what an advisory opinion um, can offer, and then go into sort of the specific legal benefits that could flow from receiving an advisory opinion on climate change from the International Court of Justice. And then if I have time, talk a little bit at a high level about um, the thinking behind formulation of the resolution and, and the question. So as 
mentioned, the ICJ is one of the principal judicial organs of the United Nations, and in fact is the only one of those um, organs that has a judicial function. Um, it has been called the world's court because the ICJ is the only judicial body with general competence to hear any question of international law and is also the most authoritative judicial body on questions of international law. It's able to hear contentious cases, which um, basically are sort of your standard um, litigation between two parties, between two states in this case, and the results of such cases are legally binding on those two parties, but not on any other states. Its other function is to provide advisory opinions, which is what we're seeking here, um, which are requested by UN organs or specialized agencies, and which provide, um, as Minister mentioned, it's sort of a clarification or interpretation of existing law. Um, that is, they pronounce what the settled law is and spell out the relevant legal consequences. And though, as we've mentioned, these uh, advisory opinions are not themselves legally binding, they are interpreting legal rules that are themselves legally binding. And the ICJ's interpretation of those rules are among the most authoritative available. So although the opinion itself is not legally binding, it has great legal authority um, in terms of application of legally binding rules and principles. So with that background, why are we seeking an advisory opinion on climate change? Again, as mentioned, it's clear that while international climate negotiations are an essential component to um, achieving a safe and habitable world for all, especially the most vulnerable, and for preserving um, human right, rights and well-beings of people, uh, negotiations have fallen far short of achieving sort of the ambitious action that is necessary um, to safeguard our, our planet and our peoples. Um, and it's also clear, not only is that ambition sort of within the ambit of the international climate negotiations fall far short of what it needs to be. But there are also a range of other areas of international law that are affected and that are relevant to the issue of climate change that are not adequately addressed within those international climate negotiations. Um, in other words, for a phenomenon as vast as climate change, it's it's essential that all of international law is considered, not just um, one single treaty. So as this principal judicial body of the United Nations, as the world's court, the ICJ um, is uniquely positioned. It has really, it's the only judicial body with the authority and competency to address all aspects of international law that are engaged by the climate crisis. Um, so, really in terms of understanding and clarifying these legal obligations and the legal consequences that flow from them, an advisory opinion is, is an essential endeavor. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate as the minister mentioned that in some ways this uh, initiative, while really important and really progressive, is also not asking the ICJ to do anything um, particularly radical. It's, it's, its core judicial competency here is to um, interpret existing well-settled principles of international law in the context of climate change and clarify their legal consequences. So receiving such a statement from the ICJ would have a number of legal benefits. Um, the first would be, uh, an ability to complement and strengthen international climate negotiations. In particular, uh, an ICJ AO could clarify the nature and character of legal obligations um, within the UNFCCC framework 
And this could encourage higher ambition action, not as a matter of discretion, as is currently sort of understood within that framework, but as a matter of duty under law. So it would strengthen, could strengthen the legal character of state obligations under um, the Paris Agreement, UNFCCC, the international sort of climate framework. Um, an ICJAO could also help to facilitate progress in negotiations, including on sensitive issues. Um, this has been sort of a demonstrable benefit of advisory opinions in the past, that they have, by clarifying the applicable law, they have helped to sort of make progress in highly politicized areas. Um, by removing ambiguity and sort of defining a narrower space um, for negotiation. So in the same way, an ICJ advisory opinion here could help to sort of narrow the space of what uh, states, in particular states who are trying to sort of um, avoid taking action, perhaps you could say, um, can argue in terms of relaxing uh, obligations. And so there's uh, an avenue there to help facilitate progress in negotiations. Another benefit, as I mentioned, is um, the ability to sort of concretely and clearly expand uh, the avenues, the international legal avenues for addressing climate change outside of the international climate negotiations and the UNFCCC framework. Um, as we mentioned, climate change is clearly having an impact on human rights, um, clearly affects issues related to the law of the sea and other general principles of law, as well as issues of inter and intragenerational equity, which are um, minimally addressed within the international climate treaties. So by uh, with the ICJ's general competence to address these other areas of law, we can receive much needed clarification, um, which will allow greater progress in terms of um, safeguarding those rights and taking actions to safeguard those rights. Another uh, benefit here is that an advisory opinion could be very beneficial in terms of domestic climate litigation. Um, in the past, advisory opinions have been very influential and regularly cited in national, regional, and also international case law, um, and can help to clarify key elements like uh, the appropriate duty of care uh, to apply in these sorts of cases, um, which has been this sort of ambiguity on these core legal issues has been a bit of a stumbling block um, for climate litigation. So that's uh, this clarification could really constitute a breakthrough um, for climate litigation. And then um, otherwise, as we mentioned, the ICJ advisory opinions have great symbolic authority, symbolic power as well. And this pronouncement from the ICJ about the legal consequences of climate change could also have a galvanizing effect on state and civil society action. I think that I am coming up on time, but just quickly, I will explain a little bit about the thinking behind drafting the resolution, um, which basically contains a preamble setting out um, key issues and then obviously the questions themselves. So in this, we uh, first reference prior General Assembly resolutions on the question of climate change, which signals the competency of the General Assembly to request an advisory opinion on this issue. We reference the key legal instruments and norms that are relevant, um, which include international climate treaties, but also, as I mentioned, other uh, relevant bodies of law, including human rights and law of the sea. Um, we set out the scientific consensus on climate change um, as expressed by the IPCC and specifically the summaries for policymakers, which is important because it represents both that scientific and political consensus on climate change. So um, in that sense, we can avoid sort of the 
an, an argument or a trial of sorts on the science. Um, rather, we already are providing this consensus-based um, pronouncement of fact. Uh, also reiterating the seriousness of climate change, limits of current ambition, and specifically the effects of um, climate change, the disproportionate effects on small island developing states and other vulnerable states, which is really important to sort of preserve this climate justice focus of the initiative, um, and also to reflect sort of the key interests of the grassroots youth movements that inspired this initiative in the first place. And then um, the question itself will reference sort of the relevant bodies of international law and put, put the question to the court reflecting both um, a, an interstate component and the interests of civil society, including with respect to international intergenerational equity and human rights. Um, so I will stop there and happy to take questions later. Thank you so much, Autumn and Blue Ocean Law, for this additional legal information about the International Court of Justice Advisory Opinion and how this constructive UN pathway may, through clarity, actually transform climate ambition under the Paris Agreement. And thank you also for taking us through the structure and the elements of the actual current draft resolution. This, uh, for participants, this is cutting edge and of great interest at the moment to UN member states, climate negotiators, and of course, global legal experts. So to the more than 90 participants now on this call, please do use that Q&A box and direct your specific ICJ questions to the minister or to Autumn or to any other uh, distinguished panelist. So while Vanuatu is of course leading on the ICJ initiative, we are also a leading voice in the global growing conversation around criminalization of ecocide at the International Criminal Court. Indeed, it was Vanuatu which opened up this discussion back in 2019 in The Hague by calling on the ICC's Assembly of State Parties to seriously consider adding a crime of ecocide to the governing document known as the Rome Statute. To give us a broad picture of the concept and progress of Ecocide International Law Initiative, I'd like to introduce Ms. Jojo Meta. Ms. Meta is the co-founder and executive director of an advocacy organization, Stop Ecocide International, and is chair of the charitable Stop Ecocide Foundation, which is our co-host for today's discussion. The foundation supports in particular, the participation of climate vulnerable states in the growing global conversation on ecocide. Uh, Ms. Meta has overseen the remarkable growth of the movement in recent years, while also coordinating legal developments, diplomatic traction, and the public narrative. The organization now has teams or associate groups in more than 40 countries. Uh, Ms. Mehta was the convener of the independent expert panel for the legal definition of ecocide. So please, Ms. Mehta, tell us more about the origins and the progress of this global conversation on ecocide and what we can expect in the coming months. Thank you so much. Um, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Ecocide is a word that is increasingly being used around the world to refer to mass damage and destruction of the environment. Etymologically, it means, from the Greek and Latin, to kill one's home. And thus it feels like a very apt way to describe what is happening to the planet at this time. The term ecocide was coined in 1970 to describe the awful damage created by the defoliant Agent Orange during the Vietnam War. And the word was first used on the diplomatic stage by Olaf Palmer, then Prime Minister of Sweden, in 1972 at the first UN conference on the human environment. Palmer called for severe environmental destruction, or ecocide, to be addressed at the international level. And it has taken 50 years for the subject to be taken as seriously as he requested, and indeed as seriously as it merited. When the Rome Statute, the governing document of the International Criminal Court, was being drafted in the 1990s, there was a clause which would have addressed severe environmental harm, but it never made it into the final treaty in 1998. So when the ICC opened its doors in The Hague in 2002, it had jurisdiction over just three international crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. Crimes of aggression was intended to be added, but took a further 10 years to define and even longer to adopt, eventually becoming the fourth crime against peace, as they are also described. Ecocide, a growing body of people believe, should now become a fifth crime in that list. 
perhaps we should pause to imagine for a moment what the world might be like today had ecocide been listed as a crime 20 years ago. Policymaking and economic practice might have been very different and a lot less dangerous than they have become. A study at Colorado University a few years back examined the effect on corporate behavior of changes in environmental law. It found that when administrative regulation is strengthened, the result is a change in corporate budgeting. However, when a criminal law aspect is introduced, we actually see changes in behavior. Instead, what we can feel today globally, at all levels, in my experience, is a deep and rising frustration with the lack of action which would actually be commensurate with the crisis we all face, and which island communities face more starkly than most. We humans are creatures of habit. We don't change easily or quickly, and the rate of change we are experiencing collectively at this time is unprecedented. Our corporate and political decision makers now have skills and technologies at their command that have led the global community to an exceptional level of productivity and a small part of that community to a sophistication of lifestyle never before imagined. And it has come at great cost to people and planet. Earth's most vital ecosystems and keystone species, and thus humanity's ability to survive and thrive, are now at stake. It's time to recognize a truth that indigenous cultures have never forgotten, that when we damage Mother Earth, there are consequences. It is time for a crucial reality check. Criminalizing mass harm to nature, or ecocide, could make a powerful paradigm level difference. Even if all emissions ceased tomorrow, if we continue denuding forests and polluting oceans, destroying key carbon sinks and vital ecosystems, we will continue to suffer from climate and ecological crisis. Ecocide law could thus address the destruction that is a root cause of ecological breakdown. Holding government and corporate actors to account, acting as a protective safeguard and deterrent. But not only that, it could act as a creative constraint inspiring the urgent, adaptive thinking that we know is desperately needed. Because when we know what we must avoid, it becomes so much easier to work out and support the solutions we need. It levels the playing field for the adaptive and regenerative work which is already being done, and which is currently an uphill struggle. Stop Ecoside International has been working for five years now, developing global cross-sector support for this law. And island nations are the leading voices, as they have been for decades in international discussions around climate and environment. So it should perhaps be no surprise that it was the Republic of Vanuatu which brought the subject of ecocide back to the diplomatic table in 2019 at the International Criminal Court's annual assembly, calling on states parties to the Rome Statute to seriously consider adding a crime of ecocide. Since then, developments have been remarkable and rapid. Before 2019, no governments were known to be talking about this. Now, discussion of ecocide law is on public record at parliamentary and or government level in no fewer than 24 countries which are signatories to the Rome Statute. From parliamentary petitions to government resolutions to full proposals of law, the range of engagement is wide and varied, but we can say with confidence that this is a serious diplomatic conversation which is now firmly in progress. In particular, I'd like to highlight three key milestones that have taken place over the last year and a half. Firstly, the emergence of a consensus legal definition of ecocide. There had been working definitions in the past, but these were always the legal opinion of one or a small local group of interested lawyers. However, in 2020, our charitable foundation was approached by Swedish politicians asking whether we could convene a drafting project to come up with a practical consensus definition of ecocide as an international crime, one which they could reasonably present to their government for consideration. This in turn enabled us to bring together top legal minds from around the world to complete this task. The resulting definition has, in the short time since its launch in June last year, become widely supported and a strong basis for international diplomatic discussions as well as national and regional ones, for example in Belgium and the EU. You will shortly be hearing more, hearing more about the definition and its implications from Philippe Sands QC, the co-chair of the panel of experts which drafted it. The second milestone was the presentation of this definition to the Assembly of States Parties at the International Criminal Court last December, and this was officially supported by three of the world's most climate vulnerable states, Vanuatu, Samoa and Bangladesh. 
For the first time, a head of state endorsed the initiative in a special message for the occasion, the Right Honourable Fiamme Naomi Mataafa of Samoa. And Belgium also intervened to express international support and also prog the progress towards a potential domestic adoption of ecocide law. The third milestone was a remarkable acknowledgement in July of this year, when the ICC held its 20th anniversary celebration in The Hague by holding a one-day conference on the past, present and future of the court. A significant proportion of the future section was dedicated to the possible addition of a crime of ecocide to the Rome Statute. The executive director of the UN Environment Programme, Inga Anderson, recently declared that she has observed this word ecocide floating to the top and that she expects it to walk its way into the UN vocabulary. UNEP's law director, Patricia Kameri Mbote, will be moderating a panel on ecocide at the upcoming COP27 talks in Egypt. Most recently, once more led by Vanuatu, the ecocide discussion reached the UN General Assembly just last week in New York, with President Vuro Boravu calling for its consideration alongside other legal avenues. At the same time, the Pivot Point report launched by the Race to Zero Climate Champions included a significant section on ecocide law as a key driver towards net zero, and businesses have already begun to sign an open letter to governments calling for this law. So as you can hear, this is a conversation that is only set to grow louder. Most importantly, it is a conversation that island states, or better described, great ocean states, can have a concrete and powerful influence in progressing. The International Criminal Court is, like the UN, a one-state, one-vote context. But unlike the UN, it does not have a Security Council veto. And a crime of ecocide at the International Criminal Court would not only strongly support the relevance of that court in relation to the most urgent challenge humanity has ever faced, it would also strongly support those countries most at risk from climate and ecological disaster. The time is right for this law. Indeed, it is long overdue. And by working together, it can be put in place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jojo, for bringing us up to speed uh, on the Ecocide Initiative, the legal definition, and how this initiative can actually address the root cause of ecological destruction, and of course, inspire that adaptive thinking and action that it's required. It's so exciting to hear that more than 25 countries are now seriously discussing Ecocide. Well, there are 100 participants on this call. Please do use that Q&A box to address your questions to any of the panelists. And now we are so privileged to have one of the world's most renowned international lawyers, the British-French barrister Philippe sans QC, to explain to us the legal reasoning behind the recognition of ecocide as an international crime. By way of introduction, Philippe Sands is a professor of law at the University College of London and a practicing barrister who appears as counsel before various international courts, tribunals, including both of the courts which concern us here today, the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. He's the author of no fewer than 17 books on international and environmental law and particularly expert on the origins of international crimes. His book, East West Street on the Origins of Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide has won multiple awards. He co-founded the Center for International Environment Law, which continues to produce some of the world's most thorough and inclusive reports on the state of the planet. Back in the 1990s, of course, Professor Sands was an early advocate alongside the Pacific for texts at the UN Climate Convention, which were ultimately to lead to the Paris Agreement and has a long history of working with us in island communities. And especially pertinent for today's discussion, he was the co-chair of the independent expert panel convened by the Stop Ecocide Foundation last year on the definition. This group of renowned lawyers and jurists uh, worked on the legal consensus definition of ecocide as an international crime, a definition which in just over a year has now become the de facto starting point for diplomatic uh, discourse on ecocide. So Professor Sands, please explain to us the importance of and reasoning behind the definition that you helped to draft, and in particular, why it and the legal recognition of ecocide are significant for us in the Pacific, and indeed the islands of the world and the rest of the world at this crucial time. The floor is yours. Christopher, thank you so much for that very generous introduction and my thanks to colleagues. I've been listening um, and watching the conversation with huge interest and I just want to pay tribute to Vanuatu, its government and its people for making a contribution in this field 
that basically straddles my entire career in international law. In 1990, uh, I attended the Second World Climate Conference in Geneva, and I worked very closely with Vanuatu's then ambassador, Robert Van Lierop. He made an enormously compelling statement at that Second World Climate Conference. I remember his words in my ears even now, 32 years later, we will not be a codicil to some international agreement. And of course, it was at Second World Climate Conference in 1990 that Vanuatu led the drafting and the creation of the Alliance of Small Island States. So Vanuatu's role, I think, is extraordinary. And when the history books are written, Vanuatu's central role will be, um, I'm sure, uh, recognized. Um, and that role, of course, continues in relation to the two initiatives that are being um, discussed. Now, I should say at the outset, um, I've had a long engagement with international law before these two courts. Um, the first case I ever did at the International Court of Justice was in 1996. Um, really started work on it in 1993. It was an advisory opinion um, on the legality of the use of nuclear weapons. And I was counsel uh, with some wonderful colleagues for four Pacific Island states, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Micronesia, and Marshall Islands. And the interventions of those four countries did produce an amazingly positive development. Paragraph 29 of that advisory opinion became the first time the International Court of Justice had ever addressed the environment. And paragraph 29 said that the protection of the environment has now entered the corpus of international law. And when we did our pleadings in that case um, at the International Court of Justice, uh, the, Pacific Island, the Pacific Island states were the only ones in the first round to address uh, environmental matters in the way uh, that they did. Many of the large powers said it was preposterous, it had nothing to do with the use of nuclear weapons, blah, 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 but the court took a different view. So there are aspects of that advisory opinion that are extremely positive. There are, however, also aspects of that advisory opinion that are extremely negative. Uh, and the advisory opinion in the end produced a result which was, in my personal view, extremely unhappy and very dangerous. The court opened the way to the use of nuclear weapons in circumstances in which the very existence or survival of a state is at stake. And it was a horrible shock, frankly, uh, earlier this week and last week to hear the um, foreign minister of Russia uh, and the uh, former prime minister and president of Russia, Mr. Medvedev, use the words of the International Court of Justice to justify the possible future use of nuclear weapons. The point that I make is that international law is a complex creature. And it is possible with the best of intentions, whether it be Ecoside or the ICJ, to open a door which unwittingly leaves, leads to consequences which may be partly regrettable. Um, and that explains through my experience, which also led to my participation with Samoa and Solomon Islands uh, in Rome in the summer of 1998 on the drafting of the statute of the International Criminal Court to proceed with real caution and care. It's not that these initiatives uh, should not um, be addressed and talked about, but do not assume uh, that this is a world, international law, in which the judges uh, and uh, others involved with the world of international law, in particular the legal advisors of many countries, necessarily share the values or interests of those who are participating on uh, this panel. That means that whether it be the ICJ or Ecoside, one must proceed with a very hard nose, so to speak. One has to be very tough and very purposeful and very clear about what one wants. Uh, that experience uh, has come to the fore for me on another uh, advisory opinion that I've been involved with much more recently for another island state, uh, Mauritius. I was very privileged to be the lead counsel for Mauritius on the Chagos advisory opinion uh, on um, the uh, completion of the decolonization of Mauritius. Court ruled that the separation of Chagos was unlawful. And just to be clear 
one has to be very precise on the legal effect of an advisory opinion. It is true that it does not have binding legal effects for states, but it has binding legal effects for the United Nations. And that has been very significant in the Chagos context because the United Nations has proceeded to give effect and to implement that advisory opinion. For example, changing its map on the UN website. So there are real advantages to an advisory opinion, but as with ecocide, one has to proceed with utmost care in how one does this. About two years ago, I was very privileged to receive an invitation from Jojo, who you've just heard from, and who, with Polly Higgins, has done a truly extraordinary job in making the world understand the concept of ecocide. And uh, I had the great happiness of co-chairing with Dior Fal Sao, a wonderful Senegalese lawyer, and to work with 10 other wonderful colleagues, balanced from across all the regions of the world, um, several island state participants, including my dear friend Naroni Slade from Samoa, who made such a significant contribution. And, and as we conducted our work, I was very much inspired by what I'd come across in the book that Christopher kindly mentioned, East West Street, which tells the origins in the summer of 1945 of the crimes of genocide and crimes against humanity, and how the lawyers who were involved in that, Hirsch Lauterpacht and Raphael Lemkin, went about their task, constructing arguments which were built on what states had done before, because states are inherently conservative, and so are international judges. So as we sat the 12 of us, to prepare a definition of ecocide, what we were very keen to do was to avoid any possibility of states turning around and saying, this has never been done before, this is a nonsense, this will not pass. And we did that in seeking a consensus amongst ourselves by coming up with a definition of ecocide, which would supplement the four existing international crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression, which in my view right now uh, is occurring in the context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And we concluded that it was right that the time had arrived when the four existing international crimes, all of which focus on the protection of the human, should be supplemented by a fifth international crime. And that international crime would have as its objective the protection of the natural environment. Now, in my experience, I mean, I live in a large island state, uh, the United Kingdom, but I have spent quite a lot of time in small island states I haven't ever been to places which are more acutely aware of the fragility of our environment, of the need to be protective, than in small island states. Small island states are on the front line uh, in this issue. And we, on the drafting group, wanted, therefore, to come up with a definition which could be slotted into the statute of the International Criminal Court, not a treaty, which I think be impossibly long uh, to, to implement. Some of you will be aware there's an initiative right now to have a new convention on crimes against humanity that is lingering uh, at the UN, despite the excellent work of the International uh, Law Commission, um, blocked uh, by countries like China uh, and Russia from uh, creating a parallel to the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, which was adopted as long ago as 1948. But we felt, yes, the time is ripe for a fifth crime, a fifth international crime, one that will put at its heart the well-being not of humans as such, but of the environment. And so we came up with a definition, and I'll take you very briefly through it. Our terms of reference were to come up with something that could be slotted into the statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, so we adopted the language and style of the Rome Statute. Um, we proposed first the addition of a new preambular paragraph, and that is taken almost word from word 
from the advisory opinion of 1996 of the International Court of Justice, paragraph 29, concerned that the environment is daily threatened by severe destruction and deterioration, gravely endangering natural and human systems worldwide. We decided to call the fifth crime ecocide. Although it resonates with the crime of genocide, it more closely resembles in content the standards of crimes against humanity. And we proposed a new Article 8 TER, T-E-R, for the purposes of the statute. And the definition we came up with is as follows. Ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. And every word of that definition is drawn from existing instruments of international humanitarian law, existing war crimes law. No one can turn around and say we've invented something completely new. We've taken from existing texts and refashioned an approach which basically indicates uh, the circumstances in which an individual, very important to note, that the ICC does not have jurisdiction over corporations or other actors. It only has jurisdiction over individuals. I've never thought that's much of a problem because it would have jurisdiction over the CEO of a corporation or the president of a country which is engaged in ecocidal activities. It means acts which are either unlawful or wanton. Unlawful alone was not good enough because uh, it would be unlawful at the national or international level, but at the national level, it's all a state needs to do is to legalize an act and therefore it be excluded. And the international unlawful acts in relation to the environment are few and far between. And so we came up with this notion of wanton acts. What's a wanton act? A wanton act is an act which is adopted with reckless disregard, as we put in our definition, for damage which would be clearly excessive in relation to the social and economic benefits anticipated. And here we did introduce a balancing exercise, and some have addressed uh, concerns about that balancing exercise. But I want to put here on the table an aspect of our deliberations, which I think was very important to all of us. And it was this, we don't want laws on the protection of the environment to effectively amount to a new form of colonialism, to a way in which the richer countries are able to impose their values or prevent the less rich countries, the global South, from taking a development path which allows it to make certain use of natural resources in order to enhance the well-being of local populations. And so the approach that we took was a balancing one in which one could envisage that certain acts which take place in one country might be ecocidal, but in another country might not be. We focused on the mens rea, knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood. We didn't want to adopt a definition which required damage to have already occurred. We wanted prevention and precaution to be embedded in our definition. The nature of the damage is severe and either widespread or long-term. Severity is a threshold and widespread refers to a geographical element and long-term to a temporal element. It doesn't have to be all three. But we were concerned to include a situation in which an act contained within a single country or even a single part of a country could be ecocidal uh, within the context um, of uh, our definition. We defined severe, we defined widespread, we defined long term, and of course we defined the environment. And in each case, we came up with definitions which were based on um, commitments that pre existed. And one thing we did not do, and we had a lot of debate about this, was to elaborate a list of acts which could be ecocidal. And the group was somewhat divided on this issue. There were some who felt it absolutely had to be done. Uh, uh, and there were others, and I must confess that I was in that group that did not want to include a list of acts. Why did I take that position? I took that position because 
I uh, have learned from experience that when you draw up lists with certain things that are listed on it, things that are not listed on it are treated as okay. This is something we found in relation to crimes against humanity and uh, genocide, uh, that uh, the identification of certain groups in terms of acts that are genocidal means that acts against other groups that are not listed are not considered to be genocidal. That, I think, is deeply problematic. But there was another issue, and I think it's very relevant to what we're talking about today. It's very clear that if you're going to produce a list of acts which could be ecocidal in nature, you would have to include on that list certain acts which have consequences for the global climate system. And in my view, the moment you link ecocide with climate change in an explicit way, the ecocide project will die a quick death. Why? Because, and I say this having participated in negotiations for many years on the delegation of the Solomon Islands, the climate change negotiations, that states will not accept the idea that having negotiated, frankly, completely inadequately at the international level for 33 years and not produced a solution, that somehow through the back door, through this amendment to the ICC, some definition of a new crime would be adopted, which will suddenly have significant consequences. In my view, the best way to deal with this is to leave it to the prosecutors and judges of the future to take the broad definition and work out on the particular facts of a case whether an individual has engaged in an ecocidal act. To conclude, um, I hope you've understood what it is that I, and I speak personally here just in terms of my own desires and objectives in this, have taken as my motivation. On these issues, I believe that less is more, that one must be recognizant that you can launch projects in the field of international law, particularly in the environment. And in so doing, if you do not get it right, you will unwittingly cause new problems that may be even greater than the things you intend to address. So one of the things I've been very concerned to do, and Jojo and I have talked about this extensively, and I think we're pretty much on the same page, is whichever direction is taken, proceed with utmost caution and realism. There will be a lot of people out there and a lot of countries out there who will be looking for ways to stop initiatives. And there will be judges out there who will be looking to turn initiatives around to ends for which they were not intended. So we must be realistic, we must be steely, we must be principled, and we must be clear about what it is we want to have come out. What that means is let us be aware of who the judges are on these international courts. We must not be starry-eyed about this cast of characters. Most of them come from a generation who never studied environmental law and for whom the environment is, frankly, a nonsense. That is the community in which some of these issues are being addressed. Do not be starry-eyed about either the ICC or the International Court of Justice or the vast majority of states' interest in relation to these issues. What I learned in the Chagos case, which has been very successful, is you've got to be absolutely precise in how you proceed, leaving no room for manoeuvre and focusing very closely adopting, if you like, a rather conservative approach to the progressive development of international law. Let me stop there. Um, uh, I hope uh, you're not seeing me as a naysayer. I'm trying in this to inject a note of realism. The experience of the ICJ advisor opinion on nuclear weapons was brutal. It would have been much better, aside from the environmental paragraph, if that advisor opinion had never been brought because of what it in, in effect opened up. And in drafting the ICC's proposed definition of ecocide, I've been acutely conscious of proceeding 
in such a way that the most conservative of countries can say, actually, yes, we can live with this. And that, I think, has been achieved. The UN Secretary General, the Pope and others have endorsed this. Belgium has become, I think, the first country to adopt uh, a commitment to this definition in its domestic law. And I hope very much other countries uh, will follow. Uh, and once again, I finish by expressing my deep thanks and deep respect to Vanuatu. It's been 33 years since I first saw Vanuatu in action. Uh, Vanuatu has changed the world. Thank you so much. Philippe, outstanding, and I echo the comments of our participants, absolutely brilliant. Uh, you have highlighted the very complex nature of international law and the need to be carefully considerate of the consequences of both of these initiatives, and uh, for also highlighting the, the fact that the time has come, uh, particularly to empower those frontline small island states and communities. Uh, but your call to be steely, principled, and clear, I think is going to be the call for this session. Colleagues, I regret that we have run out of time, so we will not be able to entertain questions. Thank you for articulating them, and I thank you, the panelists, and congratulate you for the transformative work that you are doing at the interface of climate change and international law. Thank you to the more than 100 participants who joined this discussion today from around the world, which I believe has been an incredibly useful and powerful overview of initiatives to international court and the International Court of Justice. You would have heard His Excellency Assembly highlighting both of these initiatives. It shows that Vanuatu, which is a great ocean state, hears your voices and we in the islands will be your advocates in all pathways that truly can achieve climate justice and a livable planet for all of us. Have a wonderful day and don't give up in any of your fights in any ways for climate justice and a safe living space for humanity. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Christopher, for moderating this session. We appreciate it. And thank you to all our speakers. It was an honor and a privilege to listen to your interventions today. To our audience, I want to let you know that we will have a networking session in just uh, 45 minutes away at 7 p.m. New York and 9 a.m. Sydney and midnight London. And then we will have another session using island heritage and culture to promote a vibrant economy at 9 p.m. New York, 2 a.m. London and 11 a.m. Sydney time. Please don't miss it. Thank you everyone again for your attendance and we hope to see you at the next session. And thank you to the government of Vanuatu and Sub Ecoside for sponsoring this session.